Hi, and welcome to Harvest Bible Chapel, Kuala Lumpur Online. We hope that the following message will be a blessing to you as you seek to walk with the Lord in spirit and in truth. For more information about our church, please visit www.harvestkl.org or click the link in the description below. Well, good morning to all of you this morning. Good morning. As Pastor Peter was just sharing, we are wrapping up our time in the Old Testament this morning. We are going to be looking at the book of Malachi, which is not a a popular book. It's not a a commonly read book, but uh, it's also a difficult book. And so we're just going to jump right into it, try to navigate it together this morning. Um, Bob Dylan is exactly the kind of person you would think of when you think of someone who you would call a genius. Uh, God-given talent that he learned to wield like a superpower. I mean, normally for songwriters, you engage in some kind of writing process. Maybe you strum some notes on a guitar, you mumble through some lines to form lyrics, or however the the magic happens. I don't know, I'm not a songwriter. But there's a process to it. Dylan could pop out a hit song in like 10 minutes. He has this one song that lyrically seems pretty basic, but man, if it doesn't put words to the human condition. The first verse goes like this. Broken lines, broken strings, broken threads, broken heads, people sleeping in broken beds. Everything is broken. And honestly, that's not far off from the Christian perspective. I mean, that's pretty much our language. But it's also true that we can get so caught up in the brokenness of our world that we forget it didn't start that way. And it's not going to end that way. See, God's fingerprints are all over us. And we still see evidence of His majesty all over the place. But whether you want to call it ignorance or arrogance, we jumped at our first chance at playing God. And we found out real quick that we make terrible gods. Our fingerprints of sin are all over this world. And the result is that everything is broken. And when you read the Bible, that's exactly the story that you find. That's that's Israel's story. Like, just think about it. God calls out a, a people, He calls out a family named Abraham and Sarah to start a family. And later, they have a grandson who's a cheat, and who grabs at the reins of this family. And the whole nation is going to be named after him. From there, the Lord calls out a deliverer in Moses who rescues them from oppression. God gives them the law to teach them a life of godliness. He sustains them 40 years in the wilderness with bread from heaven. He brings them into the promised land. He appoints judges to rescue them from their enemies. He gives them kings to rule them in righteousness. He gives them priests to cleanse them of sin. He gives them prophets to call them back to the Lord when they don't know their right hand from their left. Did I miss anything? Time and time again, the Lord gives them His provisions. He gives them His grace and mercy. Time and time again, He provides them all of these gifts. And they still end up getting punished and removed from the land. And with these people, if they haven't changed yet, will they ever change? And to go one step further, if they're like this, What about me? I think I have what they got. Anybody else? By the time we get to the Old Testament book of Malachi, which again is where we're going to be in this morning. If you haven't, you can go ahead and make your way there. Israel's already come home in their story. They've rebuilt their temple. They've refortified their walls and rededicated themselves to worship the Lord. That's what the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were about. But listen, these people don't need new walls and buildings. They need new hearts that fear the Lord. The book of Malachi is the prophetic ending of the entire Old Testament. Malachi's words will be the last message God's people hear ringing in their ears for the next 400 years. 
Here's a summary of what Malachi has to say. God has always loved you, but you despised Him. All the promises you made, you didn't keep. And so get ready, because the Lord's going to pay you a visit, and He will be just. How are we doing? Everybody still good? You with me? We're going to just run through this book this morning, so we're not going to be able to cover everything. But the first thing I want you to see in the book of Malachi is that everything is broken because we are broken. Everything's broken because we're broken. If Malachi were to add a verse to Bob Dylan's song from what he saw of the people in his day, he'd probably write something like this. Broken rams, broken priests, broken marriages, broken feasts, broken ties, broken trust, people trusting in broken lust, everything. Let me unpack some of that for you. The book of Malachi is filled with disagreements between God and His people. They just can't seem to get on the same page. And one of the first problems we see is about broken worship. The people's worship is broken. We're in chapter 1 here, starting in verse 6. It says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where's my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? Verse 8, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you? The way the sacrificial system worked in the Old Testament, Israel would bring all kinds of animals, sacrifices to the Lord. And when they brought their offering to the temple, there were conditions around what was considered acceptable worship. What would be worthy of the Lord? What He would accept from them? Part of the priestly job was to inspect the animals for any defect, to make sure this is a pure blemished male animal that's worthy of sacrifice. And in this case, the people were giving faulty offerings and the priests were accepting them. And the Lord's saying He's tired of it. The Lord is saying, is a father not worthy of honor? Is a master not worthy of fear? Honor meaning we give the highest priority to Him because there's none like Him. Fear meaning we don't reject His Word because His ways are perfect. Who I am. You wouldn't offer these gifts to your prime minister. It would be beneath Him. So why are you giving them to me? The people feel burdened by God. They still put up with His rules, but only because they still want His stuff. They still want his stuff. They're like an entitled teenager who wants, to take, who wants you to take them everywhere and pay for everything, but gives you an eye roll when you ask them to do something and they have to put down their phone to clean up a mess that they made. I don't have teenagers. I'm just projecting here. I'm, I don't. God's saying my laws and statutes are a gift for your good, but you treat them like a burden. I'd rather shut the doors of my house than keep getting your half-hearted worship. Verse 14, Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. Our God's name will be made great. The ends of the earth will sing of His majesty. Do you know anyone else who's worthy of such honor? But we despise His name and give Him faulty worship when we forsake the opportunity to worship and serve Him. When we don't give the Lord the significance and weightiness He's due in our own lives. When we have a heart posture that says, I just can't be inconvenienced with worshiping the Lord this week. Or I just don't have the time or interest in serving His people. I have 
far too many things to do. The Lord doesn't want me to grow weary. Really? Worshiping the Lord is what makes you weary? Who are you actually trying to serve? You say, well, no, it's, it's, not, it's not that. It's not worshiping the Lord that makes me weary. Honestly, if we're the people, it's the people that I struggle with. There's just people here that I, I don't get along with or I don't enjoy seeing. Don't look at them. Okay, this is a safe place. I understand that. I can understand that. But I want to challenge you in this way. Stop evaluating people the way the world does. Because I would hate for you to overlook the ongoing work of God among us. If someone is here this morning, it's either an opportunity to bear witness for Christ or to minister Christ to someone's weary soul. Listen, that that weary soul might be you. And so why don't you let the body of Christ minister God's love and care to you? This is part of what it means to be a living sacrifice that's holy and pleasing to the Lord. This is one of the ways we honor Him. As we use the gifts He's given us to serve His body, to serve His people, and to bear witness to His glory to the ends of the earth. Second, we see that they have broken leaders. They have broken worship, broken leaders. In chapter 2, God is even more direct with His leaders. He says, starting in verse 1, And now, O priest, This command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. If you skip down to to verse 7, the the lips of a priest should, should guard knowledge and people should seek instruction from his mouth. Not because he's great, but because he heralds God's words. Verse 8, But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. Listen, a leader is not anything he doesn't take seriously himself. He's just not. We will each be held accountable for our sin. But if your leaders aren't bringing a healthy fear of the Lord to bear in your life through the regular preaching of God's Word and the salvation offered in Jesus Christ, then as a church, you shouldn't accept their leadership. A godly leader is a gift to your soul. I mean, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. You feel the weightiness of this responsibility. It says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So pray for the leaders in God's churches in our cities. Pray that the leaders in this church would continually surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's the true shepherd. He's the one who's truly leading this church. Listen, you don't think the enemy wants to compromise the pastoral role? Go find a ministry that's bringing glory to God in Jesus' name, and I'll show you a guy who has a target on his back. But this isn't just about your leaders. You also have a massive role to play. 1 Peter 2.9 says you are a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. Priest had chosen for what? To declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. As your pastors, we want to call you into this work of making disciples to the ends of the earth because that's God's plan for you, for us. This is what He's inviting us into for His glorious purposes. And so if we stop calling to you to that, then you should reject us. Because it probably means that we've already made ourselves more important than we should be. And eventually God will reject our ministry anyway. Third, we see trust. And here the Lord is talking about broken generosity. He's saying we keep our money to ourselves because we don't think the Lord will meet our needs. And in effect, we're saying we trust ourselves 
more than God. And, and he's saying, Let, let's address that. Let, let's, let's deal with that. So in chapter 3, starting in verse 8, he says, Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. He say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. I told you this wasn't an easy book to go through. It's God's Word. That God deserves our first and best. And when we withhold it from Him, it's like we rob Him of what is rightly His. So often the Bible warns against the love of money. It's not money that's the problem. It's the love of money and all the ways it tries to twist our hearts. There's a spiritual component to our relationship with money. And the Bible says it's deceitful. It's blinding. And it takes on many different forms. Some people can't keep money in their bank accounts. As soon as they get it, they spend it. Not to spend it on daily needs, but for pleasure. Others look at their bank accounts constantly because they look at it as a source of their security. The higher the number, the safer they feel. The lower, the more insecure. One of the safeguards God established to help us get a grip on this problem was the tithe. Tithing means giving 10% of your income away to support the priorities of the Lord. You, you give to support godly leaders, to sustain the ministries of the church, to help meet the needs of the community. Today, Christians often debate about, some argue that the New Testament doesn't say much about tithing. So that means I can do whatever I want with my money. Others treat the tithe like a requirement. Like it's a measure of your faithfulness. But let me put it this way. The tithe was meant to be a safeguard. It was a way to help keep people from sin. It was to keep them in the lines, if you will. But in Christ, the tithe has been transformed. We don't need the same requirement. But that doesn't mean the practice is gone. Tim Keller says... We could never expect God would say His New Testament people with greater blessings and greater privileges should expect to give less than the Old Testament people of God. Think about that. Those who have been given more, who have access to all the blessings of the Lord, why would God expect them to give less? People who have been changed by the Gospel don't become less generous. They become more they just don't need the requirements to push them to do what they now find joy in doing. Tithing is no longer the measure of our generosity. It's the starting point. Listen, if, if giving is good for our spiritual health, which I would argue that it is, then it just doesn't fit that God would want us to stop doing it. He wants us to care about the proclamation of the Gospel. He wants us to care about the health of His church. He wants to, us to, to seek the good of the city for His namesake, for His glory and honor. And if those things aren't happening, it says that we just don't care about the things of God like we say we do. And if that's the case, we need a greater measure of the gospel to be at work in us. In verse 10, God says, Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my storehouse, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts if I will not open the windows of heaven sing until there is no more need. See, we don't give to God because He has need. We give because we need to put our money where our mouth is. And giving is one way we get God's priorities into our hearts. God wants to open the floodgates of heaven where every blessing flows. We give because we believe He'll do it. So first we've been saying everything is broken because we are. Our, our worship, our leaders, our misplaced trust, it all flows from there. Everything is broken. Second thing I want you to see from the book of Malachi is that broken people can't save themselves. God's complaints don't come out of nowhere. 
About a hundred years before Malachi, Ezra and Nehemiah led the nation in a national revival. They, they made a covenant with God. They put the whole agreement in writing. The, the book of Nehemiah records the whole thing. God has receipts for every broken promise that we've made. In Nehemiah 10, the people say things like, we will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Now, we didn't get into all of that, but, but they give themselves over to idolatrous marriages. In Malachi 2.11, it says, Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. And so they're, they're engaging in these marriages where they're practicing uh, worship of other gods. They're not being faithful to the Lord. And then again in, in Nehemiah 10, in, in verses 38 and 39, it says, And the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. We will not neglect the house of our God. That's the promise that they made. But here in Malachi, he's saying, You have neglected the house of the Lord. God and His people make promises to each other, and neither one of them seems to ever change consistently faithful and we are consistently not I remember getting in trouble a lot as a kid I asked my parents all the time for second chances and that's not fair and give me a second chance give me another chance give me another chance my parents have jokingly said we want nothing more than for you to have the kind of children we had in you and I've gotten that. And so I thank them for that. On the parental side of things, I realize that, that my cries of not fair and give me a second chance are like an insult to the one who's given me more chances than I can count. Malachi 3.7, God summarizes the, the sinful condition of Israel. But it, but it could be the, the summary of the entire Old Testament. It, it could be our story's summary. He says, From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Every generation that has seen the light of day at some point in its history has proven to be unfaithful to God. We are like a broken record that's been left on repeat. We can't fix ourselves. So what do we do? Do we just need God to give us another chance? Do we just need another reform, and another great leader to come, more repentance? How many times will God go through this broken cycle getting the same results before He just leaves us? And then, as I said before, the Old Testament closes with people left like this, left in their brokenness, left wondering what, what is next. When will God speak again? 400 years they wait for God to say something. That's a long time to wait. That's a long time to wait for God to move. So let me end our time by that Malachi gave to hopelessly broken people like us. The third thing I want you to see from the book of Malachi is that everything broken will heal. Everything broken will heal. There is a remedy for sin. At the beginning of chapter 3, the Lord says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you, will, who you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Now Malachi is being ironic here because nobody was delighting in the Lord. No, nobody desired for the Lord to come. Nobody was running to him. But God is coming anyway. And that's good news for us. Watch this. The messenger Malachi is talking about here is John the Baptist. And the entire purpose of John's ministry is first to call us to repent. And at this point, it should be no surprise why the, the Gospels open with this message, this call for repentance. We've been trusting ourselves above the Lord. We, we need to run far away from that. The second thing from John's ministry, John was, his ministry was about calling people to look to Christ for the forgiveness of sins. He says, come see the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
John came baptizing with water. But the one coming after him, Jesus, comes baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And it's the Spirit of the living God that gives you the power to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then later in, in chapter 4, Malachi starting in verse 1 says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings like calves from the stall. See, we need the same thing Israel needs. We need someone who can come reverse the curse and heal us of our sin. Notice in, as he's talking about the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's coming will be like a furnace for evildoers. But for those who fear the Lord, it will be like the sun of righteousness rising above them. Same day, same occasion, different outcomes. So he will dance under the wings of his healing power. In other words, either you will let God's justice purge you, or you will let it purify you. Either you will trust in yourself and man-made solutions, or you will cling to the saving power of God in Christ. Those who reject God hate the day of God's coming because they hate the Lord. But those who love Him will celebrate His coming because they'll know He saved them. He's saving us. He's a God who saves. Not because we deserved it, but because it's who He is. He's a God who comes near. He dwells among us. He desires to be with us. He desires to heal us. He desires to change us, to grow us, to make us whole, to make us who we were always meant to be. How does God save us? What a question. How does He do it? When the Lord comes, how does He hold His love and justice together? I mean, how, how do those things work themselves out? And the Christian says, on the cross. Don Carson says, do you want to know where God's justice is most powerfully demonstrated? On the cross. Do you want to know where God's love is most powerfully demonstrated? On the cross. There, Jesus, the God-man, bore hell itself. And God did this both to be just and who declares just those who have faith in Him. On the cross, people who have been forever broken find the power to be eternally healed. By believing in His name, by believing, by trusting in the saving power of God in Christ. Saying, give up the, all the work that you're trying to do. And all the things that you're trusting in, they just don't lead to the salvation and the change that you're looking for. There's only one who does. Or, or consider that what, what gives us the power to change is not that we treasure God. It's not that, that we desire for Him to come. That's not what changes us. We didn't treasure God. We put our treasures in other storehouses. We put our stock in other things. Other things that we think are, are going to work itself out for us. This is what will pan out. Not, not the Lord. But Jesus, no, we, we, what gives us the power to change us is that He treasures us. If you think about it, every other treasure in the world will make you give up something to purchase it. Every other God will make you do something to serve Him, to get what you're looking for. But Jesus is the only treasure that died to purchase you. He's the only God who comes and serves you. Now what does that say about you? It says that God so treasures you that He willingly laid down His life to heal you. And when that truth really grips you, when you really get around that, you dance like calves that are released from their stall. They've been freed. They dance in the light of the day. 
the sunshine raining down on them, bringing healing in His wings. You serve Him with your whole heart. You give for the freedom you have in Christ. And because you'd give anything for others to experience the same healing power. Church, I want to invite you into that. I want you to experience, I want you to live life like that. In freedom. Under the reign of His light and healing. There is life. Life in the fullest. Life in Him. You can do it by trusting in His name. By trusting in the one He sent Himself, Jesus.